well-being uh, needs to come out of the benefits department and into company culture. That the idea that we can offer these ancillary uh, um, benefits, fringes, opportunities, they're, they're good, um, but they won't move the needle on the collective understanding that's necessary to create environments that support holistic well-being. That's exactly the shift that's necessary and required. Um, for far too long, the idea of workplace wellness was we will reimburse you for your gym membership, or we will make sure that you have access to taking a personal day when you need to. It has to be a holistic cultural approach to wellness. And that starts with the leadership. I often like to, to define culture as what is um, supported, what is rewarded, and what is tolerated in a company or an organization or a family or a relationship or anything, that is culture. And so if we tell people that we care about them and we want them to be well, but we demand that they work 60 hour weeks and don't use the vacation time, we are in a disconnect. And so it's really the opportunity for leaders at this moment to say, what is it that I can do to support all of our people to live their greatest lives? That support is gonna be different for different individuals because human beings are different. And so cultural, culture and well-being requires us to start having more vulnerable, transparent and empathetic conversations with people, getting to know and understand our employees and what has value and meaning to them in their lives and then finding ways to support that. So while as human beings, we would love to have the one button push to make everything function and better, we're much better off realizing that humans are messy and all shades of gray. And so if we take the time to investigate and learn about our people, our most valuable resource, then we can find those opportunities to shift the culture in ways that create a healthy environment. People are under significant uh, amounts of stress, much more than before. And the boundaries between home life and work life have become unbelievably blurred. Um, so for organizations to really promote and to create um, uh, the acceptability of putting limits on that, of not expecting emails at 5.30 over coffee in the morning or checking them at 10 o'clock at night at the end of the day, um, really trying to promote transitions both into the work world and psychological transitions back to being a mom, a partner, et cetera. Those can be uh, incredible ways to try to help people uh, turn off their work hat. People require breaks. They require breaks during the day to recalibrate and rejuvenate their brains uh, and to reduce stress during the course of the day. Uh, and they need nights off as well as uh, vacations. So some uh, companies are even tracking vacation and personal days. And I think it's important for uh, the leaders in organizations to be role modeling this. It's not okay to provide a benefits package, but then act as though it's not okay to utilize that time off, the personal days, uh, or the vacation. You know, I think that uh, sends a really uh, implicit message to employees. Uh, you know, when when leadership isn't accessing those benefits as well. I think um, it's really important to have employees involved. So surveys, um, meetings where there's brainstorming activities that the employee feels as though they have some say, uh, both in the benefits uh, that they get, but also in the flexibility and, and operation of the company. Uh, I think that's one thing we found in the pandemic is that the employees really knew what they needed in order to provide uh, more higher quality work and productivity and a lot of times didn't feel heard. So that's super important. Um, being flexible, providing uh, adjusted work schedules, et cetera, is very important. Uh, and celebrating successes. I think we have to 
make goals short and long term and then reinforce them when they're obtained recognize that all human beings crave development <clears throat> excuse me and that that doesn't necessarily mean simply additional training for the responsibility or role that they might have within your organization but the development of them as individuals and people so we we have trainings we we go we go through education um but there's not a lot of emphasis on helping people develop their emotional intelligence helping people develop their communication skills helping people understand how to have difficult conversations or even engage in productive conflict we don't teach those things in schools so if we can bring that kind of training to our staff in a, a work environment not only does it help them as individuals grow but it also helps their relationships with one another and when those are are more productive and more positive and more just more in sync with one another we end up with a better workplace you need to have the ability to let go of your need to be right because we can't learn anything about what's important to other people or what our organization might need what our people might need if we've already made up our minds as to what is correct so by being able to let go of our need to be right then we open up the doors to possibility and that's how we figure out how to find a better way I work with leaders. I certainly um, am I'm a leadership team in my company. And uh, I think the greatest question we ask ourselves is what can shift in my fixed perspective? Because we get fixed in our perspective and without remembering, I, I think innocently that our perspective is born out of our life experience, our behaviors, our attitudes, you know, everything that makes us as unique as our fingerprints. Competitiveness in the law, at least that's our, our background in other highly competitive environments, is born out of a scarcity mindset. It's born out of a mindset that there is only so much to go around. And I, I said this once, I think, in a, a managing partner meeting where uh, someone said to me, I, I like to throw somebody in the deep end of the pool and see if they can swim. And that's the person who I want to hire a lone wolf who knows how to go out and do and get the job done. And, um, and I asked, um, do you know that that's not how wolves hunt in nature? <laughs> they, they don't hunt alone. So what we're asking humans to do is contrary to the example, um, because there needs to be cohesion. There needs to be, and as Kathleen mentioned, there needs to be the development of skills to learn to work outside of the scarcity mindset. It's, you know, it's the me culture. What's the we? How does rising tides raise all ships? I think that's the question. And so it comes with fundamentally breaking down a mythology because there are definitely four legs to the stool of the competitive mythology. And once you start breaking those down, you have the opportunity to build new myths. And that's what it is. It's new storytelling around these myths um, because, and I'll let, I'll defer to Carrie, but that's how humans learn. We learn through storytelling. It's how our brains are set up. So if we remythologize with each other, those lessons, they get ingrained and we can become who we want to be as a team. Absolutely. I think it's, it's shifting that mindset into um, that we are pack animals and an organization that develops a team that works towards a common end will then become competitive as a group rather than internally competing with one another. And so giving your employees, even if it's a fun task, some sort of problem or some sort of task to complete where they have to learn to collaborate with one another and not one person stands alone is a way of getting the change in the mythology and then to put into action where individuals have to practice collaborative behavior towards a common goal is a great combination of both the cognitive and the behavioral coming together, which really can alter culture. It also speaks as to the storytelling component that human beings by nature of how we are wired seek purpose and meaning. And so if we have a, an organization that is large enough to have individual departments 
um, creating purpose and meaning so everyone has a shared goal, a shared understanding of what it is that we are accomplishing. And it's not, I'm, I work in the accounting department and I work in the logistics department and I work in the HR department. What is the greater purpose and meaning of this organization? How is it that we are affecting change in the world as an organization? Because when the story becomes larger and it's not tasks and daily responsibilities, but it's attached to the story of purpose and meaning, then that's part of that cultural shift that um, is necessary and will we'll change the, the wellness component of work. I think that over the years, stigma with mental health has really made it so that it's a secret discussion or not a discussion at all. Uh, I think the one positive about the pandemic that I've certainly seen is that it's, it's put the topic on the table um, where we don't have an us versus them uh, in terms of mental health issues, but that everyone uh, can understand what it's like to have uh, life turned on and have increased levels of stress and anxiety and so on. So educational uh, pieces around uh, anxiety, depression, letting people know um, that they can take a mental health day. Uh, I even talk with uh, leaders and companies to overtly themselves start to infuse the language into, you know what, I'm taking a mental health day on Friday because I really need a day off. And that along with training and overt conversation, like even just a lunch and learn to sit down and be able to humanize the topic of mental health and depression and anxiety. And of course, at this juncture, substance abuse rates uh, are, are some of the most poignant lost days um, that companies are experiencing. So to put it out there uh, and really um, normalize the conversation. For some people who might be listening who are skeptical or have an organization where there uh, are shift employees, um, again, letting go of our, of our need to be right. So there might be some pushback by people who say, well, you just don't understand our company or our organization or, or how we do things around here. Great. Or is it that you're stuck with how we do things around here? So for example, if you have an organization that typically has shift work, uh, that doesn't mean that the shifts don't need to stay in your organization, but what questions can we start asking our employees about, hey, your shift is from 10 to 10, but I'm recognizing that's not really working for you. So can we job share? And could you do 10 to five and someone else does five to 10 and then you're here a different day? It's the willingness to ask individual employees about what their needs are and finding creative ways to meet them where their needs are that will allow us to create that flexibility and wellness. And it's not necessarily easy. We're asking ourselves to think about things in a brand new way that we haven't thought about them before, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't ask the questions. Well, I'll just, I'll just try to round that out because I think that's absolutely accurate. And what Kathleen said about skepticism, uh, and skepticism, uh, skepticism has its place, but it doesn't build, it tears down. So it's really important if you start out with, if anyone starts out with, well, you don't understand. Um, I think the question that we have to ask ourselves is what don't I understand? What have I missed? What have I not seen? Where am I closed? Um, because trying to speak to be understood rather than seeking to understand can be a very limiting mindset and it blocks our creativity. Constructive mindset as opposed to skeptical or deconstructive mindset requires an openness and a flexibility to solutions that we may not have seen before. And so once again, we come back to, it starts with leadership. It starts with the questions we ask ourselves and the difference between being critical and having critical thinking. You know, being critical is the ability to point out the problems in everyone else's thought form. Critical thinking is the ability to look at our own. So as a leader, I think we need to practice both and maybe not even an equal portion. I think there is such a denial of being able to say, I need 
or I want, because we're so conditioned to think about how it's going to be received or responded to that we almost deaden our needs or mitigate them before they're even out of our mouths. And part of what I say to my staff is, I can't meet your needs unless you're able to tell me what they are. I'll just be guessing. So the number one thing I think that's so critical is to build that self-worth that it is okay to find, speak your needs. Find them, speak them. Now, if I can meet them, I will. If I can't, I'll have that conversation too. But but the worth, the worth work around value and being able to speak needs, I think is how we can support employees to the to the absolute um, to their absolute benefit.